environment. So we're going to start off with a bit of a recap of the new board of students' presentation. I uh, apologize. Um, does anybody from the original presentation remember what anti-diluvian means? No. <laughs> sealed forever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later they were bound to get you. This introduces the family, a very small group of people that have been infiltrating 
classic says they've been leaving them in complete disarray. <coughs> they work for Big Brother. And if any of you have actually read Georgia Orwell's 1984, you know where that's from, and that's what that quote was. Uh, Big Brother is the leader, leader of a uh, completely dictatorship, dystopian society that is entirely oppressive. And so they pour freedom of thought. So these guys are trying to eradicate what they consider the new plague. And they've become aware of these other worlds where there are free thinkers and they want to take them out. This is also why they wear the plague doctor garb, because they are the units taking on this plague. So it's up to Finley. She's going to have to enter the sword. And luckily, she has her company issued a feather quill that doubles as a sword. And since it was originally a quill, it can absorb the essence of the world's children, <coughs> aka the words, and uh, take on their attributes. So I mentioned earlier that both have changes game elements in gameplay. What exactly did I mean by that example? Well, say for example, Finley has entered a world and she's found out that there is a town being ravaged by the horrible black cat piece. And so she needs to go find this and defeat it. And along the way, as she's approaching where she knows this piece to be, she still, you suddenly get a uh, snippet of text in this narration that says, Sprinting around the corner, Finley nearly ran head <coughs> into the cat. The player's going to be presented with three options. They've got to quickly choose one of those. So if I pick inimical, then I'm going to tear in the corner and see this horrible beast. And that's going to be kind of a pain to beat. But if I pick calm, then I turn and I get this <coughs> creepy, creepy thing. And I would then be fighting that. And lastly, if I pick innocuous, I'm going to get this cute new guy. <laughs> 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 uh, as you can see, it's, it sort of plays like a choose-your-own-adventure game where at certain points you've got to quickly pick a word and that actually changes what then you, you get to face and fight. <coughs> but as I mentioned earlier, the sword in particular can take on traits. So let's say after I fix my kitty, I get another option where it says, Really felt no fear, she broke but drew her sword. I have three more options. If I pick Radiant, then my sword is now imbued with this great shining light, and that helps me out because it's going to be, whatever's fighting me is going to have a hard time paying attention to me and will have a harder uh, time actually hitting me. If I pick Multitudinous, then my sword might transform and get extra features, so now I've got a long range and a short range ready. And if I pick Evanescence, well, that's going to be uh, pretty, pretty disappointing for me when I start fighting and then it vanishes. <laughs> so, even in the event that you pick like a bad combination where like say I pick the inimical cat beast and the evanescent sword, I should still have a way to defeat that. It'll be harder, but it'll still be, you can still do it, it's supposed to be frenzied and fun. That's the point. We don't want to make words burdensome. So, even if you get the bad combos, you got that. And even if you get the good combo, say I got the innocuous kitty and I got a radiant sword, uh, I would still probably feel pretty bad about you know, being on Portal King. So I mentioned that the, they become attributes, but they don't just become attributes in those quick events. The benefit of picking the inimical cat earlier is that now that I pick that word, that goes into my vocabulary list. And that means that later on in the game, I can equip that to my sword and get an awesome sword. And that's kind of how it works, is which word you pick. Depending on what you can attribute to later. I mentioned earlier that she overlooks the classic section. As you can see here, there are tons and tons of works in the public domain that have by amazing authors um, that we can take a lot of inspiration from. The reason that we're especially doing this too is because this kind of works as double dipping for educational purposes. Because if you put the environments in worlds based on literature, you don't have to be explicit about like, I don't have to say, oh, Shakespeare was born in this time and quiz you on that stuff. But I can inspire you so when you're in class reading Shakespeare, you can like, Oh, Lady Macbeth, I totally beat her yesterday. That's awesome. <laughs> and it's just more exciting when you're actually having to learn that. And for the purposes of Capstone, I would recommend that we do Edgar Allan Poe. Now, if you're wondering, why Poe? Well, he has a great breadth of work. You've got between pendulums, you've got creepy dead chicks, you've got giant mansions and castles, you've got the black cat from before. There's hot air balloons and hoaxes involved in that. You've got uh, these creep angels made up of uh, dubious alcoholic containers. You've got mummies, and you've got really angry orangutans. And that's just naming a few things. So there's like a lot to cover with this guy that you can make tons of characters and dating environments from.
Secondly, uh, he immediately establishes a more mature, mature tone, because even though he has a bunch of romances and comedies, most people associate him with horror. So since we're trying to appeal to that more mature audience, automatically having that tone helps us. And as I mentioned, he does do comedy. It's very tongue-in-cheek. <coughs> also, we're going for it. Uh, this brings up our style and tone. For our style, we got influences by Tim Burton. It's a uh, it's quite as well as his political um, setting. We also have Psycho Knots. Apparently, they're quite popular. <laughs> Another boss battle. How awesome is that? 
And not only that, but if you defeat it, then in the game you get to summon it. So if I go and I get all my achievements done early and I unlock that raven later on in the game, if I'm fighting a villain and I've got a bad combination and I'm really in trouble, I just summon the raven and it comes in and just feeds on the thing. So, to wrap up, what are the goals for Ken? First and foremost, we want to create a fun game. We don't want to go the round and round where it's education versus We want education that's part of our goal, but it's got to be fun. <coughs> Have games, uh, gamers learn to retain higher level vocabulary. We've got to see if we can actually accomplish that and make sure that they remember it the uh, Part of the challenge with that, especially artistically, is going to be able to depict it efficiently in a visual interactive way. So like in example with the town, we had to have very specific facial expressions to get that meaning across. That's going to be true of all the interactive, interactable characters representing things. They've got to embody that word. We've got to inspire students to become more enthused about readings in class. So if I'm reading The Raven, I can be like, yeah, I'm not that with you. <laughs> and lastly, we want to experiment, because this is something that hasn't really been explored as in-depth as I think we should, and right now is the perfect time to do it. Because if we do it now as students, if we fail, there aren't any big repercussions. And in fact, there are only benefits, because if you go somewhere and tell someone you tried that, that is still impressive, even if it failed. And if it succeeded, even more so. So I started you guys off with the idea that we did. I'm going to leave you with another word, but close. Innovation. Questions? I'll do that one.